Hello, my name is Joanna Lewis. I am the Director of the Science, Technology, and International Affairs Program, STIA, and a professor at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. And I have the pleasure of welcoming all of our distinguished alumni, students, and others from the Georgetown community to this exciting event. Today, we're here to learn about a spectacular new book from one of our STIA faculty members, The Sirens of Mars, written by Professor Sarah Stewart Johnson. When you came across the advertisement for this event or the wonderful stories about the book that appeared in outlets like the New York Times and the Boston Globe over the last few months, you may have been surprised to learn that an SFS faculty member was writing a book about Mars exploration and the search for life on other planets. But that's part of what makes the STIA program so unique. Our faculty are trained in science and technology fields and conduct research and teach classes on topics that examine the intersection of science and technology with international affairs, including global health, information technology, climate change, and even planetary science. We are the second largest and one of the fastest growing majors in the school, and we're excited to be launching our first ever STIA graduate program in collaboration with the Master of Science in Foreign Service program. And today, we are thrilled to host the author of Sirens of Mars, Professor Sarah Stewart Johnson, in conversation with Kai Rizdahl. Sarah Stewart Johnson is an associate professor of planetary science at Georgetown, where she runs the Johnson Biosignatures Lab. She's a faculty member both in STIA in the School of Foreign Service, as well as in the Department of Biology. And she's also a visiting scientist with the Planetary Environments Lab at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. She's worked on NASA's Spirit, Opportunity, and Curiosity rovers. She's a former Rhodes Scholar and White House Fellow, and she received her PhD in planetary science from MIT. Kai Rizdahl is the host and senior editor of Marketplace, the most prolific program and business in the economy in the country. In addition, he joins forces with Marketplace Tech's Molly Wood to connect the dots on the economy, tech, and culture as co-host of the podcast, Make Me Smart with Kai and Molly. Before his career in broadcasting, Kai spent eight years in the US Navy. He worked with the Joint Chiefs of Staff at the Pentagon, and he also served in the US Foreign Service. And most importantly, Kai is a Georgetown alum with a master's degree in security studies, and he's been a Georgetown parent. So thank you all very much for joining us today. And I will now turn it over to Kai to get us started. Joanna, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. And thank you all for your time. There's Sarah, I don't know how you feel about this, but there's nothing more excruciating than hearing your bio read out. So I'm gonna I'm gonna come completely clean with everybody uh, at the start of this interview. I read this book in like a day and a half. Sorry, let me get it up there to the camera. Um, I'm a space geek to begin with, but this was um, this was a really cool um, read about stuff I wasn't aware of. So um, those are my priors going in. Um, but I guess, but I guess the first question, Sarah, is um, why do you want to write this book? Uh, that's a great question, Kai, and and thanks again for being here, and thanks, Joanna and SFS. I mean, this is really exciting to have a chance to talk with you about this book that I wrote, and why did I write it? Oh, um, I guess I I felt like Mars maybe just deserved a, a different kind of treatment. Like there were so many things that I would come across just in my daily work as a scientist that I felt would never really find expression on the pages of scientific journals. And there would be, I don't know, I guess my mind would sort of wander away from some collection of data or I'd be sitting in some seminar and there'd be something that just struck me as really evocative or poignant and I'd start scribbling it down. and. And before I knew it, there was just there are just all these things that I just felt needed some sort of expression because I mean the book is about science, but it's also about our human relationship to this planet. And I, I wanted to be able to bring some of those things together into a narrative. And I guess that's what I hope I've done here. Uh, you you said it was uh, um, things that were evocative that got to you. This book struck me. I mean it's prose, but it struck me in some ways as almost poetic. And I want you to. Um, tell me about this place called the Nullarbar Plain that you start the book with. Um, one of the many cool explorations you get to do in your research in science. Tell me about this place and why you go there. Uh, 
So this is one of my favorite field sites. Um, so one of the things we do in our laboratory is, is we're really focused on detecting and decoding biosignatures or these traces of life. And, and so my students and my postdocs, we go out to these extreme environments around the world, places that have relevant similarities to the Martian terrain. And we, you know, we, we try our hand at some of these techniques and, and we work hard to see if we can find traces of life in places where life might not be all that abundant to start with. Um, and there's this one place in Australia and it's hard to get to. You have to take a couple flights to Perth and then you have to drive for a day or two on these, these really empty highways just out to the edge of the Nullabar Plain. And there are these lakes, these incredibly acidic, salty lakes that are a great analog for what we think lakes might have been like during a certain period of history on the surface of Mars. And the mineralogy in some ways is very similar. And we can look into these lakes where there's just the most astonishing array of life present. And, and we go and we search for clues and we look for the kinds of places where life might be held and preserved, these traces of life. and. Um, I don't know, it's just one of my favorite places to work because it feels like you're on Mars, you know, especially when it's dusty and the sun is setting and you can just climb up on the hub of the truck and look out and, and it's, you kind of feel like you're in another world altogether. It's, um, oh, it's just an astonishing place. <laughs> is, it, is it Mars for you that is the magic or is it the idea of exploration and, and finding life? Uh, so I think it's the latter. I I love Mars and I'm so drawn to it because I think it's one of our best chances to find life. But there are plenty of places in our solar system and beyond that also deserve to be explored. I think for me, it's really this question of, you know, are we alone in the universe and why are we here and why is there something and not nothing? And did that something from nothing? Did it happen once or did it happen time and again? And those are the things that, you know, really captivate me and keep me up at night. For, for the, for the non-scientific among us, why do you, and I imagine other scientists, think that Mars is the most likely place to find life somewhere else in this solar system? Yeah, well, there is a diversity of thought about this. Okay. Um, okay. But as one of the sort of Mars huggers among us, I really have always loved the idea of Mars. And, you know, there's no place more similar to Earth that we know of, you know, even of all these extrasolar planets that we've found, these exoplanets, you know, we've never found a place that's more similar. And if we look back in time, you know, billions of years ago, around the time that life was getting started here on our own planet, the conditions on Mars were very similar. Um, and then our planets took these different evolutionary paths. But back then, early on, um, we know at least there's a possibility. We know that all the starting ingredients were there, all the things that at least life as we know it requires were present. And it's just this question of like, did that spark take place or did it not? And the other thing is we've just done so much hard work, especially over the last 20 years. We've sent missions to Mars every 26 months as the planets align on the same side of the sun when we have these opportunities. And, and we've been able to just scour the surface and, and we've done the hard work of getting to know the place. And, and I think, you know, as, as this planet, as we've marched out a truer understanding of of what this place is and where to look and how to look. I think that we're most, we're best poised, I think, to make a big discovery now because we, we just know the planet so well. So let's do a little history here, which which you do in the book. Um, you start with Mariner 4, I think, in 1965, right? Um, yeah. What did we expect to find when Mariner 4 launched it and got there? Oh, it's just, a, just an astonishing moment, right? So this mission goes off to Mars. We've we've had one planetary mission at this point. We sent a probe to Venus, Mariner 2, but it didn't take any pictures. And this was the first planetary probe where we were going to see a world for the first time. Um, oh, I just wish I'd been there and been alive as those first pictures came back. And I think there was so much anticipation and so much excitement about what we were going to see. 
um, nobody really knew, but it, we we had this sense that you know for centuries even Mars has always been kind of a a mirror for the Earth, kind of a reflection of what we've. I don't know, almost wanted to find, like you look back, you know, over the centuries and, and Mars has always been in many ways, just like this other earth, but these pictures came back. There's this wonderful scientist named Bob Layton and he really pushed hard that there be a television camera on this mission. And at first people, you know, there was a big feeling like science, like pictures, like pictures aren't science, you know, that's public mm -hmm. relations. Why do we need pictures? but he really pushed for it. And, and we got 21 pictures and it was a fly by mission. And it's amazing that it worked. Um, you know, there are just all these, you know, hiccups along the way, but it took these pictures over the swath of the surface and a few lines of a 20 second picture. But when they came back, they were just so bleak. Like they were covered with craters and, and really people hadn't expected to see craters at all it looked just like the lifeless moon and and the fact that there were craters there meant that there was no real resurfacing of that planet there was no water that was coursing across the surface there was no rain there was no plate tectonics there were none of these processes that we were so familiar with here on earth and I think it was staggeringly disappointed. The New York Times even declared that Mars was a dead planet, you know, on the front page of their newspaper. Um, but I don't know, it's kind of like a hockey stick. We had a real disappointment there, mm -hmm. but then we sort of built back up with, at least we didn't stop going. We kept going back and finding new things. <laughs> we kept going. We've had some some misses, right? Some probes didn't make it. There were math and measurement errors and all of these things. And then, and, and this is, uh, I'm going to throw this out there and I'm going to see what you think the the real public interest in this um in recent decades was when those two rovers landed and kept going and kept going and kept going and they i forget their names even though you put them in the book yeah, and spirit and opportunity are those yeah. the ones you're talking about yeah. yeah yeah what what was it about the rovers that you think ignited this in the public mind because i remember reading this in the lay press about these rovers and and um and it just seemed like a moment for me ah well i mean it was a real turning point in exploration and it wasn't these weren't the first rovers we had little pathfinder it was the yeah. size of a shoebox and it had gone in 1997 and it went you know several meters but not not anything like the sort of distances miles and miles and miles that were covered by spirit and opportunity and it was a real paradigm shift in how we went about exploration you know so many of these missions had just been landed missions you can look at the rocks right in front of you but then you're done you know there's just there's no sense of exploration the way we think about exploration going out on expeditions and you know you can see these pictures of these distant hills and you can't help but want to know what's over the cusp of those distant hills but then all of a sudden we had these these mobile rovers that were able to do that. I mean, they were the size of golf carts and they just trundled very slowly, but they went on and on and on and on and on. And I think that was another amazing thing about that mission and those two rovers. They were only designed to last 90 days and they just went on for years, you know, several years for Spirit and then Opportunity just recently um, ended up, I mean, it's just like my entire <laughs> postdoc and professor career, like it was still going, which was just incredible. I mean, it covered tens of miles and it went, we, we had this joke on the team about how, you know, we, we would go from crater to crater to crater. So these big craters are where you punch a big hole in the ground and you can see the layers of rock and they're, they're laid down kind of like the pages in a history book. You can read back in time by looking at these layers of sedimentary rock. And so craters are great because they excavate those for you. And so the rover would kind of go from one crater to the next crater to the next crater and they would get bigger and bigger and deeper and deeper as we went. And um, and there was this one sort of target way off on the horizon, this idea of like, if we ever get off to, you know, Endeavor Crater, Victoria Crater. And there were these, they were named after these ships, these ships that uh, these, you know, there was the Fram and there was the Endurance. And these were these classic ships that were associated with exploration. And uh -huh. Steve Squires, who's the PI of that mission made this joke. But by the time we got to this final crater, it would only be a couple straggling grad students remaining and everyone else would have died from scurvy because you know, this mission just went on and on and on and on uh, um and, but I think, oh go ahead Kai, sorry well, and there's one on the way now right 
perseverance? Well, so there's one on the way now. That's right. So we had Curiosity, which is a big right. mobile science laboratory that's still going. That's ascending this mountain called Mount Sharp, which is higher than Rainier above Seattle. And then Perseverance just launched at the end of July. Um, and this is just really this breathtakingly ambitious mission, which is going to go and collect samples. We think about 43 samples that are all about the size of a pen light of Martian rocks and soils and bring them back to Earth. That's the idea is to collect them now and then there will be two other missions to go fetch them and then bring them back to Earth where we can really have them in our laboratories and hit them with everything we've got. So this is going to sound a little flip, but I got to ask it anyway. Um, Elon Musk, he of Tesla and of course SpaceX, um, has said part of the reason he founded that company was to get humanity off this planet and somewhere else, Mars specifically. Um, would you go if he called tomorrow and said, hey, we're leaving in three days? Oh, you know, Kai, like when I started graduate school, like I was for sure I was gonna be an astronaut. That was my big ambition. And I thought that that's, that's what I would do with my life. And, and it's part of the reason I went to MIT because they had, had more astronauts that had come through the kind of like civil side and not the military than any other institution. Um, and it's something that, you know, I, th I thought really seriously about at different points, but I've never actually applied to the astronaut corps. And, and I got to this point where I think I just realized that there, there were ways in which the kind of robotic exploration, the planetary exploration that I've had this extraordinary opportunity to be part of can take us so far and the science that I'm fascinated by and again this question of are we alone I, I feel like we're best poised to answer that with some of these robotic attempts that we're making um and also mm -hmm. I, I think I've, I've I've gotten older I've got these two little kids I mean it's hard for me to even go to Antarctica <laughs> I, I don't even know I could like leave them behind and yeah. and like going to the moon I mean the moon is easy that's a business trip you know a couple of days there a couple of days back two weeks you're done but like if you go to Mars we're talking at least right now with the current propulsion yeah. technologies the three two one blast off chemical propulsion we have um like a two and a half year journey because you have to get there and then you've got to wait for the planets to come back on the same side of the sun and then you got to come back and that's just, I don't know. I just, I can't imagine, I can't miss a thing. I can't even miss like, you know, six weeks with them, much less two and a half right. years. <laughs> um, okay, so a couple of other things from this book and then we're gonna open it up. If if anybody out there who's watching has questions, um, get them to us and, and we'll throw something in there. A um, Couple of things about this book. There was a guy who made an appearance in this book that surprised me and, and I guess it's a gap in my knowledge. Talk to me about Carl Sagan and Mars, because Carl Sagan is, for those who aren't aware, he was arguably the most popular scientist of the 1980s, right? I mean, he was like this rock star science guy, but I didn't know there was actually substance behind what he was doing with Mars and exploration. Talk to me about that a little bit. Yeah, and there's a lot of substance behind what Carl Sagan yeah. was doing. I feel like, you know, there were, there is, uh, I think that there were he there were some struggles kind of within the scientific community, and some of it I think just came out of some professional jealousy. You know, Carl was had an incredible way with words. I mean, you can go back and read the books he wrote. You know, just yeah. extraordinary prose. But he also, you know, he was a media personality. He was on Johnny Carson all the time, um, and I think there were some in the scientific community that felt like you know, his kind of enthusiasm and optimism about things like the search for life, um, you know, created some difficulties in a sense. So, the big point at which he intersected with Mars, and he actually had lots of interest in Mars throughout his career, but he was part of the imaging team on the Viking missions. And so these are oh. in the late seventies and these were the first two missions to touch down on the surface of the planet. Um, and so, Part of these missions, there were life detection experiments aboard. There were three biology experiments and then this chemistry instrument that were really scouring to try to find evidence of microbial metabolism, you know, sort of respiration cells doing things um, in the surface soils where these missions touched down. Um, and then Carl had this amazing way he'd written this book and he'd been interviewed in Time magazine and he had, he had this whole case where, you know, hey, these cameras, these cameras might be the best life detection instruments we have. And what if, you know, some huge creature walks by, you know, all my colleagues are looking for these little micro 
isotopes, but actually on a planet that's cold and dry, maybe evolution would have selected for these very large kind of macrobes, these loping polar bear like things, because they'd be less likely to lose heat and moisture. Like they would have a, a bigger ratio in terms of volume to surface area. If you're very small, you've got lots of surface area and not much volume. But if you're very big, comparatively, you've got a lot more volume to surface area. So you could lose heat and moisture less rapidly. And so like that's a scientifically sound thing to say. But I think um, you know, he he was sort of playful with reporters and he was imagining like you know, siliconating mm -hmm. giraffes and you know these like Christophages that were, you know, like purple turtles. I mean, he had the most extraordinary imagination. And I think in his mind, like if it hadn't been proven impossible, like why, why not? And I think that he brought so much to science with that sort of perspective, just this, you know, what if life is just beyond the confines of our imagination? What if there are all these other possibilities out there? But I think there was a, a moment where those Viking life detection instruments came up try and you know this was the build is the greatest history the greatest experiment in the history of modern science and it it, it failed like they didn't detect life definitively and i think that there were some in the community that felt like you know there was all this hype among the public and that sagan had contributed so much to this and and maybe that's why you know, we had this long lull where we didn't go back to Mars. We didn't have any Mars missions for 20 years from the mm. late 70s until the late 90s. Mm. I think there's a bit of a struggle, but I have always really admired Carl Sagan. And I think that that kind of imagination and that spirit sort of me, it's like, it's, I think it's very, very, very important. And I think we need scientists like him in the mix. And and look, let's be honest, right? Public relations. I mean, he was good at that, right? He sold what he had, and that got people interested for sure. Um, okay, a couple of questions from the audience. I'm going to combine two here: one from Elizabeth Drummond, and one from Christian Wagner, who's on the SFS faculty, apparently. Oh, yeah. uh, it's, not about, it's not about Mars. It's about the Moon. And this announcement the other day that Moon has been found in the sunlit uh, water has been found in the sunlit areas of the Moon. Number one, what does that mean? And number two, now what? What do we do with that? Oh, uh, well, they're like water on the moon. I mean, so first of all, it's amazing that, you know, it exists over these, you know, long time scales in these places that we didn't necessarily expect to find water. And so that was a really exciting discovery. I guess this was announced maybe on Monday of this week. Um, but I think that it's been so interesting because there's a big push, you know, this whole Artemis program, this idea of going back to the moon and doing lunar exploration with astronauts and water is a, a key resource, you know, if we're going to do human exploration. Um, and it's, it's it's interesting. I mean, it's part of why space is a little frenetic. Every time there's a different administration, there seems to be a different goal. And I think for a long time, there's been this long-term goal of like, we should go to Mars, but if we can't go to Mars directly, if we still need to develop some technology, if that's too great a leap and we need an intermediate step, you know, what should it be? Should we do an asteroid capture mission? Should we go back to the moon? Should we just skip it all and go straight? Um, and so right now there's a big focus on this idea of going back to the moon. Um, and I guess we'll see. I, it's, uh, it's been really interesting because we have this, you know, every time there's an election and we've got one next week, you know, we might have a different focus kind of in the coming year or we might not. Like it'll just be really interesting to see what happens. Does that make you crazy? The, the degree to which your science and exploration and your professional life is subject to political whims? Yeah, but really any of these enormous scientific endeavors are always going to have, they're inherently political and economic in nature, and you've got to have taxpayer dollars behind you because it's not inexpensive to like, send these complicated robots off to do science. Yeah. I think there's this key intertwining of those things, and it's exactly why we need students doing things like STIA that are, you know, really well versed in the science, but also understand that in those, those policy angles that can help us get these, these, you know, really exciting things off the ground. Mark Friend has a question from the audience, and it's, and it's, uh, it's actually pretty good. Should, should we stop trying to find life on Mars remotely and just concentrate full bore on getting there and look for life that way? Wouldn't that be a better way to do it? Hmm. Some people would say so. Like some people would say, like there's still no invention that's as as sophisticated and extraordinary as the human 
brain. And so, you know, even our best rovers, we put them down in the Rocky Mountains, they'd have a hard time finding a dinosaur bone, whereas like a really well-trained geologist would, would probably be able to do that eventually. Um, you know, but there's so many problems and complications that also get introduced so like we are these bags of biology and i don't know if you guys have seen the martian you guys have seen what like a base would look like you're throwing your waste products out the window <laughs> i mean once we arrive on mars we bring not only ourselves but all of our microbes all of the terrestrial life and there's no way that we can do this kind of contamination prevention the cleaning the sort of planetary protection that we we work really hard to do on these robotic missions and it it kind of confounds things. Um, you know, you can look at this even when you think about, like we, not our lab in particular, but there are a lot of people in the field that look back and try to reconstruct just the earliest signs of life, you know, looking in places like the Pilbara in Australia, trying to put together what life was like. And there's this like massive overprinting of modern life that makes that really mm -hmm. difficult. You know, when you're trying to find the needle in the haystack or like the, if you've got low signal, the noise, you know, it's, it's hard to do and it could be hard to do once we have a planet where we're definitively introducing life to it um and so that's a real challenge and there may be ways that we can kind of do these hand in hand but as somebody who's just very focused i, I think that there's just so much that could come from that discovery i mean we've only got one data point for what life is i mean biology is largely a descriptive science and we don't have the kind of underpinning laws and reasoning because we just have this one data point and I think for me finding a second data point is so extraordinary and and while those things may be able to go hand in hand and I think there are ways that we could be really careful and maybe have special regions and, and only send rovers to certain parts of the planet I'd, I'd really like to see the science lead on these things uh since you mentioned it uh I'm gonna guess you saw the Martian right yeah. Okay. It was so great. It was my first semester teaching at Georgetown and I had all these SFS students in this freshman seminar that was about Mars. And I think they'd all come to Georgetown to study terrorism and like all these things with international relations. And I was like, let's talk about life on Mars. But thank goodness that that Martian movie came out just as soon as I started teaching. So a couple of weeks into the semester, we all went down to the theater down on K Street and we all watched the Martian together and they all got very excited about Mars. Were, were you able to enjoy it or were you like, oh, no, that wouldn't happen. Couldn't do that. Wouldn't do that. You know, it was actually pretty good. There were a couple of things, but even um, even the author of the book knew that there were a couple, you know, a couple of things that um, that were, you know, more narrative drama, like the idea that the math could tip over, even though that wind wouldn't have been strong enough to tip it over. But Andy Weir, who wrote that book, it was it was kind of crowdsourced in a way like he had. Mm -hmm. I guess it was on Reddit or something. He was getting all of these yeah. ideas from scientists and engineers. Lots of people that worked at JPL were pitching in, and it, like you know, the science in that in that book is actually quite good. Yeah, it was cool. No, I I totally enjoyed it. Um, okay, so um, back to your book. Uh, <laughs> I want you to tell me about the moment you were sitting in a in a lecture at some point. I guess you were undergrad, maybe thinking about graduate school um and it the woman giving the lecture was a woman and you had this moment of realization about women in science and there's a whole thread we can do but i want you to describe for me why that was so um notable to you oh well it was it was this really pressy moment and it turns out that woman her name was maria zuber and she went on to become my phd advisor which was incredible but um, it was, I'd gone to this conference and this field, you know, planetary science, it's, it's much better today than it was, you know, however long that was. But I, uh, you know, it kind of looks like the Elks Club, you know, like there just isn't a lot of diversity and there aren't, there aren't you know, it's just like, it's a, there are a fair number of older Caucasian men in this field. And, and I think it was just this, uh, this moment where something just, seemed different and I couldn't put my finger on it immediately. And then I realized it was the first time I'd ever heard a woman giving a talk in planetary science. And it was, I just, I think I just felt something like in my chest of like this, this, and it was extraordinary. I mean, I should also just say that this was one of the best talks I'd ever seen. You know, Maria, who this woman who went on to become my PhD advisor, she had 
worked incredibly hard on this instrument called MOLA, and it had it was a laser altimeter to map the surface of Mars in exquisite resolution. And she had these beautiful, just technicolor images of the planet's surface. And I mean, I just felt like they shone to me like a church window. I mean, I looked at them and I looked at her and I don't know, I just felt like she sort of spoke for me and all these other aspiring young women that were in that room. And I don't know, it was just, it was amazing. It was really amazing. And and we're, we're doing, better, but still only about 15% of NASA's mission participation, people working on ops are, are women. And we just, we need everybody. We need everybody. We can't just draw from certain segments of the population. We need all these people to come together if we're going to ask these really big questions and try to answer them. So, so here comes the tougher question to you, and it's a version of what Brian Zaleski asks from the audience. He says his daughter's going to be three years old next month, but for all young women, how do you get them, not you, you, but you, us, get them interested in the hard sciences? Because look, it, it is challenging, better now for women, as you said, but it's still challenging on, on a lot of levels. What would you, what would you say? Yeah. Um, you know, like, I think that there is, there's this moment, I, I grew up in Kentucky and there was this program, there's this program in the high school in my town, which was a math and science program. And I took a test when I was in eighth grade. Um, and there were, I think there were actually two tests. One was like an aptitude test and one was a, an interest test. And, and these questions, I think they must have been code, like kind of gender coded in this really interesting way, but they were like, what would you rather do? You know, look at, you know, rocks under a microscope or go to the mall with your friends or something like that, you know? And, and I took this test and, and I scored, I guess, so low that they thought that I wasn't interested enough in science and I didn't get into that program. But, you know, I was, I did have this kind of inherent interest in science, even though I'd gone through this phase, especially kind of when I was in middle school. And, you know, there was that moment where I felt like it wasn't cool to be interested in science. I didn't want to be a big nerd, you know, like all of these <laughs> things, which was just, but thank God that didn't like end up defining me, you know, like that could have been a moment where I just felt like, okay, close that door. This isn't the direction I'm going to go. But like, I, and maybe it really did take me getting to college and just finding that I was gravitating toward these subjects. You know, I, I, I wanted to learn more. I just, I couldn't, I couldn't imagine sort of after a while a life without this kind of exploration and this scientific wonder in it. Um, but I think a big part of that is is role models. And I, I do think of that, like I think of what Maria did for me and, and not just Maria, but other folks, there's this incredible woman, Lindy Elkin Stanton. And I remember when she moved in at, in graduate school, she was a young faculty member and just like walking into her office just felt so different from walking into the offices of the other professor. They just felt so welcome there. And it was, it was great, but I think having, you know, people to look up to having these networks where, you know, you can sort of see yourself kind of taking that next step along that path to becoming a scientist, I think is really important. If, if you couldn't be concentrating on Mars, do you have another planetary favorite in the solar system? And oh, by the way, what do you think about Pluto getting kicked out? Sorry, let me yeah. just ask <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah. So it's so funny, you know, and of course, like all these kids now, they're like, of course, they're just eight planets. But when you grew up thinking there were nine, I have this professor that I'd studied with um, named Rick Benzel, and he had this little bumper sticker on his car, and it was like, honk, if you think Pluto's still a planet. <laughs> Um, oh, sweet Pluto. Well, it's not my top choice for astrobiology, though I will always love it. And of course, when the, the New Frontiers, New Horizons mission came back and it had this beautiful heart, you know, just this gorgeous heart on the side of it, it just made me love Pluto even more. Um, but I do actually have, I mean, a couple of favorites. It is really hard to pick. Maybe I could, maybe I'll say three. There are okay. three places that I'd love to go if, um, if, we, if we go to Mars and things turn up dry there or that we could also go to in tandem. And that's the nice thing about NASA's portfolio is we can, we can go to a lot of places at once. But um, there, there's Enceladus, which is this tiny moon of Saturn. It's about the size of England. It's one of the brightest objects in the solar system. Uh -huh. It's got this beautiful ice cover and beneath it, a liquid water ocean. 
Um, and there are cryovolcanoes near the South Pole that are spewing little samples of that ocean, this briny ocean water out into space. And so it'd be a great destination to go by. You could just do a flyby mission and capture some of that liquid and we could look for life there. Um, Europa is another big target. So this is a big moon of Jupiter um, and it's just an extraordinary system. And we think that that underwater ocean, the same thing, it's an icy world with a crust and underneath a liquid water ocean. Um, and we think maybe some cryovolcanism there with these plumes that we could also sample. But that ocean has been there, we think, since the creation of the Jovian system. So a very long lived kind of more stable water body there. Um, and then I guess if you were going to make me pick chess one, I've, I've always been kind of partial to Titan, which is a big moon of Saturn, and it's so different than any of these other places. So it's not an ice sheet with an ocean underneath. It's this place where it's dominated by a completely different type of chemistry. So you've got like lakes of liquid ethane and methane and these hydrocarbon rains and water's not the solvent, but you've got these hydrocarbons that act as solvents that are in liquid form. And and when I think about life and what kinds of really different types of biochemistry, what kinds of different molecular frameworks life might be built on in a world like that, um, it gets me really excited about possibilities for exploration. Do you remember the first time you looked in a telescope and saw a planet? Yeah, well, it wasn't through a telescope. It was with a big pair of binoculars with my dad in the backyard. But yeah, that's um, he is a bit of an amateur astronomer and an amateur geologist. And so we got to spend time together looking, you know, those were his big hobbies. And, and so that was really fun. And so we didn't own a telescope when I was little, but he was really good with a pair of binoculars. Wow. Um, from John Johnson in the audience. Uh, and it's a oh, little bit of a question. So, yeah. What's he saying? <laughs> so it's a tough question, actually. Ethical point oh, on the situation of Mars. My dad always asks me the hardest question. So what does he want to do? <laughs> Here it comes. It comes. And look, I know you've thought this through because that's clearly your vibe. <laughs> if if life is found through remote means on Mars, and we know, as you have said in, in our hour here, that human in-person exploration will contaminate that environment, um, should we not then go, right? I mean, if we're gonna mess it up, how can we go? Oh, good question, Papa. Um, and so this is like, I don't know, it's sort of at the heart of some of the most difficult moral questions that we have to ask ourselves as a species. You know, Carl Sagan, you know, famously wrote that if life is found on Mars, if there are Martians on Mars, then Mars should be for the Martians, you know, we should leave mm. Mars for the Martians and they should just be developed and it should just be like a big old sanctuary that is off limits and and I do find myself really seeing a lot of value in that point of view um, and there are definitely different different ideas out there like even when I was back in college I got to do this summer internship called the astrobiology academy and it was out in California and it was probably the most exciting thing I'd ever done but we met this um, really wonderful astrobiologist named Chris McKay, who's um, always been kind of one of my favorite astrobiologists out there. And I get to collaborate with him occasionally now, which has been really fun. But he had this thing that he described, you know, he was saying, by the time life evolved and developed, by the time humans were on the scene here on Earth, you know, there were 100,000 different species of orchids that had developed and it was kind of like a bull in a china shop like no matter what humans did they were gonna they were gonna break things they were just gonna break things and and you know you look at kind of what we've done and we've broken a lot of things but you know from his perspective if you think about mars like mars is like a bull in an open field where you know like there that's where humanity belongs and this is like if you take the perspective that life is good even like martian life is is inherently valuable they couldn't humans you know with all of their intelligence come along and and do you know, geoengineering terraforming type things couldn't we help the martian life that maybe kind of hanging on like maybe there was a big thriving biosphere on mars early but after the magnetic field went away and the atmosphere got sputtered off to space and the planet entered this deep freeze maybe there are ways that we could sort of rehabilitate that life and you know help it develop and that it's not necessarily mcdonald's on mars if you know we we um 
colonize or become, you know, have human habitation there. Maybe there are things that we could do to kind of enhance their own life. So it's always been sort of an interesting argument that, um, and there are a lot of people that do sort of espouse yeah. or do yeah. adhere to that idea. Uh, so this is kind of related and it's a version of a question Marco Gonzalez asks from the audience. Do you think we're alone in this universe? Yeah, I don't think we're alone in this universe. And if I think that, um, you know, when you think about the possibilities, I mean, there are just so many planets and so many stars. It's kind of crazy to think that that spark would have only happened once. But again, we don't know, like we don't have the data. And I think for me, this idea of making that kind of connection of just that, that next data point, you know, and if we find life on Mars, the next planet out, you know, like uh, if we just like next door, like find life, then I just think like if that especially is an independent genesis, the idea, I think we, we can feel so much more confident that there's just like a whole hatchery of different biospheres out in this huge, huge universe for us. But the thing is like the universe is, is, is huge and there's a speed limit, you know, it's the speed of light and it's pretty mm -hmm. slow really. And, you know, for us to kind of make contact with some of these really distant worlds, it seems, it seems hard to do, but I guess I'm encouraged because I do think about how we looked at Mars even just a century ago and it was just this, this distant world and the idea of actually going there with missions, you know, to be able to touch down on its surface and do science there. I mean, I'm sure that just felt like science fiction. And, um, you know, it's just like this little aberration of light. And, and that's kind of what these other planets look like to us now, that maybe there'll be enormous technological breakthroughs and we'll, we'll be able to send these you know, teeny missions, like half a gram, which we propel with lasers. There might be all kinds of ways that we can get to know these other worlds. So, uh, so you were talking about 100 years ago. 100 years from now, what's the science? Do you think we're on Mars, humanity? I think we will have gone. I think that we will. And I think that, again, that's probably something that if I'm, you know, I think honestly and most realistically, like I think that there will either be another space race, possibly with China, or there will be private industry, you know, coming in on the scene and deciding, you know, to to really go forth without government participation. You know, what I would most like is to see, you know, a big international mission with lots of partnerships sending humans off to Mars. But, um, but I don't, I don't know. But I do when I think when I think about the leap, the sort of technological leap between what we had uh, in 1957 before Sputnik, when nothing, nothing had like gone up into space, and then we had 12 years later people on the moon. And I think about going from nothing to that. And even though there are really significant challenges, technological challenges to getting to Mars, like I think that leap is a smaller leap than going from nothing to people on the moon. And mm. so I think that the stage is set for rapid progress if we decide we wanna, we wanna make it. So this is the one and only public policy question I'm gonna ask you, um, mm -hmm. it goes like this. We have uh, a lot of things in this country that we need to spend a lot of money on, right? Mm -hmm. Infrastructure, education, environment, climate, I mean, lots of stuff, a lot of money. Make the case for spending money on scientific exploration of places that are 897 million miles away. Yeah, well, this was like never more pressing, I think, than in July when we were going forth with the launch of the Perseverance rover, you know, this huge, you know, multi-billion dollar mission that was going up to Mars and, and it, it was like we're in the middle of a global pandemic and this massive recession and like you know here we are like how do you argue that the next dollar should be spent on mars and not on a covid vaccine you know it's like a very very hard argument to make um you know and like there are a lot of decisions about do you proceed with this launch um, and I guess at this point, you know, 90% of the money had been sunk already, you know, it had all been developed, it was all but, you know, heading to the launch pad. Um, but it's it's this question that sort of comes up and, and there sort of has to be a balance. I mean, the same sorts of things come up with stuff like arts funding, you know, yeah. like maybe you can't say that like this next dollar should go to some, you know, person writing a symphony but like at the same time maybe you can say that this tiny piece of this big portfolio should 
potentially go and um you know and you can look at these missions in the context of you know like they're less than you know some huge bomber you know like there are like a hundred new like i don't know f whatever bombers in the military are making and these missions are like all less than like one of those and you can sort of imagine that maybe that's worth it i think from the scientific perspective we think about you just sort of think about the nature of biology and and just how little we know and I feel like the discovery of another type of life, I think it would be better than anything any sort of pharmaceutical company could come up with. Like we could come up with these constitutional, fundamental new understandings of how biology work. And, and I just think like, especially now, like even in this time of the pandemic, like we need science more than ever, you know? And we need investments in basic science and those investments in basic science that we've made along the way are really, the things that are going to help us out of some of the most intractable problems we're facing. Well, so to that, actually, from, from uh, Keith Hennessy in the audience, uh, this idea of basic science benefiting from exploratory science, right? Yeah. Um, what fields do you think, actually, that the rest of us use in everyday life, as opposed to all y'all, the planetary scientists? Um, mm -hmm. where, could, where could the rest of us get the most benefit from, from your work, if you have a thought on that? Ah, uh, well, yeah, well, I mean, so I think in my work specifically, well, I think that, you know, the space program has brought us a lot more than just, you know, Tang and Velcro. I and mean, when we have things like the global positioning satellite system, we have GPS, we have even like I think about these big problems that we were facing. So even like the ozone hole, these two scientists that were the first to kind of make the link with the catalytic properties of, of chlorofluorocarbons, these chlorine bearing species, Sherry Rowland and Mario Molina, they had been doing experiments on the atmosphere of Venus, you know, trying to understand chlorine species in the atmosphere of Venus. And that was a, a sort of key breakthrough that eventually led to, you know, understanding the chemistry of something very deleterious that was happening here on our own planet with the opening of the ozone hole over Antarctica. Um, and so I think that there are these fundamental things that uh, that come from looking out and reaching and asking some really different questions about different worlds, you know, different worlds that are, you know, have these similarities to us and that are familiar, but are at the same time are kind of indescribably foreign. You, um, you end this book with a description of a, a box that you have in your lab or in your office someplace uh about it, it's uh i think you use the word artifacts i could be wrong uh mm -hmm. of, of exploratory scientists who are no longer around um and uh there's lots of stuff in there right there's maps and and pictures and all of this um what's what's your favorite object in that box from these scientists gone by mm. yeah i love this box it's just kind of like all this detritus in a way like it's all these things that have kind of I've sort of sifted together and tried to make sense of you know one of the things about this book is there are these people these predecessors of mine from all different walks of life you know from just extraordinarily different backgrounds that have had this same kind of deep calling and deep just need to know that it put them on this quest of trying to find life on mars and life in the universe and ah uh, there's so many beautiful things in there um i guess maybe one of my favorites and it's the image that i write about at the, the very end of the book it's the series of still photographs that were taken by opportunity it was just this one day it was a it was a sunset on mars and there's this incredible thing that happens when the sun is setting on mars it's not a red sunset it's a blue sunset and it's just this why, is it, why is it blue so the reason is is because there's so much dust in the martian atmosphere and so the sky actually looks kind of a butterscotch color when we originally went to mars there was this expectation with the viking mission that we would see a blue sky and even the very first picture that was released to the public had a blue sky on it with the viking mission correctly because everyone was expecting this blue sky or even like a blue black sky because the atmosphere was thin but there were all these tiny tiny particles of dust they were as fine as cigarette smoke it's just this tiny pulverized dust that's been worked over and over and over through the billions of years 
And so here on Earth, our sky is blue because of something called Rayleigh scattering, where it's the blue wavelengths that get most reflected and scattered off the tiny particles, um, the air molecules. But on Mars, what's reflecting most are these little little tiny bits of dust, which are much larger. And so ray sc Rayleigh scattering really gives way to this thing called my scattering. It's a different type of scattering. And, and so what happens with Earth is one reason we have a red sunset is when you're looking across the horizon through lots and lots of atmosphere, instead of straight up through a little bit of atmosphere, but through lots of atmosphere off on the horizon. On Earth, all that blue light is scattered away and you're left with red light coming through. But on Mars, it's the opposite. All the red light gets scattered away and you're left with this blue light that's coming through. Mm -hmm. And it's just the most holy, incandescent, amazing, different, weird you know, thing. And it just reminds me of just all the beauty in this planet and also just how it's constantly surprising us. You know, like I can understand scientifically why that happens, but I just, it's just, it's still, it catches me to, to look at that and just how it just it just it really rips at your understanding of the physical world because it's so different from what you're used to seeing but it's still just one of the most beautiful things i've ever seen okay so from from the poetry of that to the peril of this moment um it is tough for you and for anybody to go out and do field research now uh in fact i would say probably impossible right so what do you do if you're a planetary scientist who wants to go back to the Nullabar plane. Ah, you just hunker down like everyone else. I mean, I just think about all of the um all of the things that all of us are missing out on, you know, <laughs> like whether it's field research in Australia or like our kids going to school or our grandparents being able to like get together for family birthdays, you know, we're all we're all making these big sacrifices. And, you know, and so we've reshifted a lot of the work just in our own lab, like so the Georgetown students that are working in my lab, we've found remote projects for many of them, or we found data sets we've already collected that we can write some papers on. But I just think, you know, somebody had said this and I thought it was very poignant where it's just like, you look at what we've done over the last seven and a half months, it may feel like nothing, but you know, if you've like stayed home and you've stayed inside and you've done what the CDC has said to do, you've probably saved somebody's life, you know, just by like sitting on your couch watching Netflix, by just staying inside and not going out. And, and I think about that a lot. Like maybe there's somebody that, you know, like wouldn't be here if I didn't do that or if like everybody didn't do that. And so, I don't know. We just, we just hope. But the nice thing is, you know, like this is not like the vaccine is hard, but it's not like by any means the hardest scientific thing we've ever come up with. And it's just a matter of time. And I'm 100% certain that we'll get there and that we'll be able to use science to get us out of this mess. Well, that was the theme of this whole talk, science, uh, and where we find ourselves. Sarah Stewart Johnson uh, at Georgetown, I, I thank you so much. And look, I'm, I'm going to give the book another plug because I really dug it. I took the cover off, but but here you go. Um, that's the book, The Sirens of Mars. Um, I appreciate everybody who joined. And, and uh, uh, Joanna Kelly, I don't know if you guys are going to come back and do a little bye-bye, but um, I think that's where we are for the day. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone for joining us today and for the great questions. And on behalf of the STIA program, the School of Foreign Service, and the Georgetown Alumni Association, thank you very much to Sarah and Kai for taking the time to join us all today and sharing your insights and perspectives on the sirens of Mars. Goodbye, everyone, and stay safe. Bye, everybody. Thanks a lot. Yeah.